Okay, my friends, I'm, I'm just amazed at what I'm discovering. This is Ovid, the Metamorphosis. Now, I read all these things. Yeah, you know, you read them and it's just kind of nonsense. Well, now I'm going back and reading them, understanding it's not nonsense. Some of this stuff could actually be true and some of it is fabulously amazing. Let's start with as the earth was being created, the primal chaos. Now, I want you to know something about Ovid. He claims that everything is made out of creatures' bodies. Basically, the landscape is. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is Roger. Once again, we are going to be diving deep into the original texts that talked about the formation of the earth, creation. All of these things were written in great detail and have always considered to be crazy because they are, they sound crazy, but they're not. Now, this is metamorphosis, which means changing like from a, a, a chrysalis that holds a, a butterfly and then the butterfly pops out. That's the change. They can morph. It's morphing changing from one thing into another. And the gods could do that. They could change themselves into anything they wanted. And just for fun, they would change people and other things into landscape. Now listen to this. this he's got 15 books. He was one of the most highly regarded writers in history. Even to, the, to this day, if people understood him. Now, book five, uh, which one is it? Well, book five is really interesting. Perseus' fight. Oof, that's amazing. But anyway, he starts his whole, his whole epic work by saying metamorphosis or transformation, that's transforming something into something else, is the unifying theme. It's in all of his works amongst the episodes of his great work, Metamorphosis. Ovid raises its significance explicitly in the first few lines of this work. He called poems. They're, they're, they're not poems, they're works of art. He says, In nova fert animus mutatus decree forum cupora, which means, I intend to speak of forms changed into new entities. Accompanying this theme is often violence inflicted upon a victim whose transformation becomes part of the natural landscape. <laughs> and we see them all over the place. And, and I mean, a lot of them are posed. They just could transform them instantaneously. Listen to this. A great variety of transformations from human to inanimate objects like the Nile River, or constellations, or animals, from animals to ants and to funguses and mushrooms, <sighs> changing sexes and hyenas and colored pebbles. They could make anything into anything they wanted. And Zeus, who is literally the planet Jupiter, Jupiter, Zeus, same guy, he would come to Earth in his morphed body as a giant human and have sex with all the women. He was he was a womanizer extraordinaire. Okay, remember, this is a compilation of work. Really Hesiod was the one that wrote about the first ages and Ovid has taken all this work and taken it together, but Hesiod was like 800 BC, and that's really about the earliest works, because he was writing stuff that the daughters of Zeus, who was around there at that time, was saying, here's what we want to write to, to glorify our father, Zeus. All right, now don't forget, this is Ovid. He's bringing it all the way up to Julius Caesar's time. So he's really working through Hesiod, who wrote, theogony and all that stuff real 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 early so he's starting right from chaos the four ages the flood and the, right, right down right from the beginning so let's start with book one let's see what he has to say about the primal chaos and then the separation of the elements the earth and the sea the four winds humankind the giants 
Jupiter threatens to destroy humankind. Jupiter is the planet, and it did. Well, I tried the best it could. It got most of it. Now, here's the primal chaos. All right. And this is actually Ovid's words. They have this text. It says, I want to speak about bodies changed into new forms. So they can change the metamorphosis. You gods, since you are the ones who alter these and all other things, inspire my attempt and spin out a continuous thread of words from the word's first origins to my own time. So from the first words to his time. Now, before there was earth, or the sea, or the sky that covers everything, nature appeared the same throughout the whole world, what we call chaos, just chaos. He explains it quite well. It says it was a raw, confused mass. Nothing but inert matter, badly combined, discordant atoms of things, confused into one place. There was no titan yet. There was no creatures yet. No titan shining his light on the world or waxing Phoebe renewing her white horns or the earth hoovering in surrounding air balanced by her own weight or watery Amphrodite's Amphitrite stretching out her arms along the vast shores of the world. Though there was land and there was sea and air, however it was unstable land, unswimmable water, air needed light, nothing retained its shape, one thing obstructed the other, because in the one body cold fought with hot, moist with dry, soft with hard, and weight with weightless things. This is the primordial chaos. Spoken of in all the ancient texts, there was a great chaos. Well, then what happened? The separation of the elements. All right, this is just over-the-top stunning. Nothing retained its shape. Everything was all mixed up and jumbled up, obstructed with another, because in the one body, cold fought with hot, moist with dry, soft with hard, there was no separation of all these things. So what did God do? Separation of the elements. Listen to this now. This conflict of the, all this confusion, chaos, was ended by a God and a greater order of nature, since he split off the earth from the sky, the sea from the land, and divided the transparent heavens up above, way up, from the dense clouds of the earth. When he had disentangled the elements and formed the atoms, basically, and freed them from the obscure mass so they weren't just all balled up together into craziness. He fixed them in separate spaces in harmonious peace. That's the resting atoms. They're in their own harmonious space and peace. Now, weightless fire. This is what blowing my mind. Because fire is weightless. It's nothing but electrons. It's the heat that forms the heavens, and it's up above, all in the ether. It is nothing more than electrons. The weightless fire is electrons, which is heat. It forms the heavens, it's the electrons coming through, which is light and heat. It darted upwards of the light to make its home in the furthest heights. That's the ionosphere. That's where the electrons are, in the ionosphere. And I can prove this and show them to you. Next came air in the lightness and place. Earth heavier than either of these drew down, that's the gravity, the largest elements and was compressed by its own weight. Well, it's the dark matter inside is compressing it, yes. The surrounding water took up the last space and enclosed the solid world. Now listen to this. This is very important. Very important. This is again very, very early written. This is Ovid re writing the stuff that Hesiod spoke of. He says, The earth and the sea and the five zones, 
when whichever God, and they, at this point they didn't know which God it was. This is after the fact, but they did know this happened. When whichever God it was had ordered and divided the masses, the sun, you know, the earth from the sky, the water from the land, and collected it into separate places, as we just talked about, he first gathered the earth into a great ball. All right, so he took the earth, gathered it all up into a ball so that it was uniform on all sides, a ball. Then he ordered the seas to spread and rise in waves in the flowing winds and pour around coasts of encircled land. He added springs and standing pools and lakes. Now it goes on and on how he divided everything up and the four winds. All of this stuff had to be taken into account and how the earth scrubbed as it spun through space. Then he had to come up with humankind. What are we going to do about that? <laughs> that's that right there. That, that one there is a toughie. Um, and it goes on and on. It's just stunning. He had barely separated out everything within fixed limits when the con constellations that had been hidden for a long time in the dark fog began to blaze out through the whole sky. They can see everything. No region might lack its own animate beings. The stars and forms of gods occupied the floor of heaven. So up looking out, uh, it's, they were everywhere. The sea gave a home to the shining fish, earth took the wild animals, and the light air the flying things. As yet there was no animal capable of higher thought that could be ruler of all the rest. So humankind was born. Either the creator God, source of a better world, seated it for divine. Or the newborn earth, just drawn from the highest heaven, still contained fragments related to the skies. So they didn't know about this at this point. Nobody did. So who was Prometheus? So that Prometheus, who so they say is the father of Noah, Prometheus, blending them with streams of rain. So he took mud and streams of rain, molded them into image of all controlling gods. So he molded them into what apparently these gods looked like when they were in their human god form. Because they could be anything they wanted. That's the problem. That's where I run into a little bit of difficulty. What did they look like? It appears they looked like us. But in what form were they taking when they did that? Is that just so they could walk around and, I don't know, you know, and have sex and stuff? I don't know. Because apparently that's all they wanted to do. They wanted to come down and have sex with the women. Because the women were pretty hot looking chicks when they, you know, they just said, wow, they look good. Let's go down there and do what we want. Okay, my friends, this is going to start a new little series about revelations and some of the early ancient texts that were prophecies that seemed to have come true. There, you know, there's a lot of things that were written in these early texts that we've always laughed at because they talked about gigantic giants who Enoch said were two and a half miles tall. And they didn't put his text into the Bible because, I think, because he, they thought he was crazy. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you, it sounds insane. But we have all now, I think everybody that's followed me understands, this is not silly whatsoever. It is actually factual. And actually, we found body parts in space from the battles in the heavens. All of this stuff now. In Revelations needs to be re-examined. I mean, all the whole, everything needs to be re-examined 100% across, right across the board. But I want to look at Revelations because as I recall some of the things that were said in there, they now make sense to me. They're disturbing, marvelous, spectacular. <laughs> Call it what you will, but... I now call it quite likely factual. So all the things that we laughed at, 
dragons, giants, fallen angels, you know, planets literally being what they said in the ancient myths. We need to examine the whole thing again. So we're going to start with Revelations. I'm going to um, go through a little bit of this today, but this is going to be a kind of a long-lasting unveiling. We, we, we've never, ever taken this literal or decided to look at it in a literal way, I would say for a minimum of 2,000 years. And now, knowing that the dragon exists, giants exist, even Yale said that great flood happened, no, they give it a whole different context. No, no, no. They, they, they preserved all my mud fossils, soft body creatures preserved during this worldwide great flood. Worldwide. One thin layer, rapid precipitation. That's a flood. Salty waters, entire worldwide. That's the only way it happens, is a worldwide global flood, which was precisely what was stated in these kind of texts. Now, we're going to look at those, and we're going to look at some of the statements that are, you know, literally don't make any sense at all. But we're going back to when this was written, these texts were written. Things are different now than they were then, just like when Venus passed Earth and changed everything on Earth. So we can't say all of those ancient texts apply today. Not Some of them with the geography of the earth and so forth don't apply today. They're totally different. The earth had to be totally different at one time to support these gigantic creatures. I agree with that. But today the earth is what the earth is. You look at it from the space station and you can see everything. That's how I can tell from um, Google Earth all of the stuff that's on earth. It's very simple to understand and I understand the way the earth is going to burn up, and it's going to burn up because it's traveling through space. And that, if you were smart enough, could calculate long ago how long it would take to spin through space and, and get to a point where it would literally overheat and burn up, which is what's happening right now. Now, in addition to that, they want to find out who are the good people and who are the bad people. It sounds to me. And they're separating them out by leaving some bad guys here on earth to corrupt the people on earth. And the ones that are corruptible, out they go. The other ones, up they go.